Let's be turning this morning to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, and we're going to read just one verse, verse 6. And it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I want to preach this morning on this thought, He shall be called. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, this morning for your goodness, Lord God, that we're here in your presence, that we get to celebrate the gift of your Son, Lord. Lord, not just now in December, but God, every single minute of every single day, Lord, this gift that means so much, Lord, to us, God. Thank you for the gift of your Son. We ask that you would just anoint this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He shall be called. December is finally here. I love this time of year. It's one of the most joyous times of the year. Uh, We're excited about it. There's an excitement that leads all the way up to Christmas Day in this month. And and one of the most exciting things about Christmas Day uh, that we learn all the way back as a child is is waking up on Christmas morning and we rush to the Christmas tree to see uh, what gifts have our name on them. But it was so exciting to to look. And and even before Christmas time, you would go around the tree and you would kind of look and see whose name was on what, and you would see which name, and then you kind of imagine it, and maybe if you were a little bad, you would take it up and, and shake it a little bit and try to see what was inside of it, and hopefully it didn't, uh, wasn't fragile because you probably broke whatever was inside of it. But you look and see what Christmas gifts have your name on it. And the giving of the Christmas gifts on, on Christmas Day has been going on now for hundreds of years. And nothing is more exciting than getting a gift with your name on it. See, sometimes gifts are given kind of nonchalantly, and, and other times they are given with deep feeling and love. But without a doubt, the greatest gift that was ever given with the greatest love the world has ever known was the gift of God's Son. We see in our text, it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. See, God didn't give us a gift that would fade away in time, or a gift that would bring us joy only for a moment, but one that not only we could love, but one that would love us in return. And that gift, of course, was the gift of His Son. Perhaps the most well-known verse in the Bible is John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He what? That He gave His only begotten Son, a Son is given. That whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. A Son is given to us. Who is the Son? Well, this text that we looked at this morning, Isaiah 9, 6, describes Him in five ways. And we're going to look at those this morning. First, He is described as wonderful. The word wonderful in the Hebrew is Pele, which means a miracle, a marvelous thing, something that causes wonder or amazement. You see, it's hard for us to describe someone as vast and as amazing as God, but one word that we can definitely say He is, is wonderful. Almost 20 years ago, uh, the songwriter Stephen Hindelong and Mark Bird wrote a beautiful worship song that became very popular several years ago. It was called God of Wonders. And it says, Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky, the heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy. Let me tell you something. He is a God of wonders. He's a wonderful God. All of God's creation shouts out this morning that not only is He holy, but He is wonderful. He's a God. God of wonders, and this is so important when we come before Him that He can do exceedingly above all that we can ask or think. There's nothing boring about God. When you see Him face to face, words will escape you. The only thing you will be able to think is how wonderful He is. I love the thought of that. That one day our faith will be made sight. Sister Georgia, your mother's faith was made sight. She sees this wonderful God that we read about in His Word and experience His presence. But now her faith is made sight. And one day soon, all of our faith will be made sight. And we will see the King of kings and Lord of lords. 
I love that song. They made a movie about it not too long ago called I Can Only Imagine. Because it encapsulates the reality of that day when we stand before Him. What will we do? Will we sing in His presence? Will we dance in His presence? Will we just stare at Him in awe and marvel at His beauty and His goodness? I can only imagine. But the only thing I know for sure is that when we see Him, the King of kings and Lord of lords, that we will finally see just how wonderful He is, how good He is, that all the things we experience in this life are nothing compared to knowing Him. Second, He's described as the counselor. The word counselor in Hebrew is yaletz, which means to advise, to counsel, or to guide. See, all of us are faced with so many decisions on a daily basis. And many of these decisions have lasting consequences. And many affect us for the rest of our lives, for either good or bad. You see, when we're young, we decide what college to go to and what career to go into and what job to get. And when we're maybe a little bit older, we decide the person we will marry and spend the rest of our life with. We make all kinds of decisions from buying houses to buying a vehicle to buying furniture, whatever the case might be. But the greatest and most important decision we can ever make is the decision to accept Jesus into our hearts as Lord and Savior. And with all All of these choices, God knows that we need His wisdom and His counsel to make the right decisions. He knows that we have hundreds of choices that we make on a continual basis. And He also knows the weight and the outcome of each of these choices. But if we are wise, we will ask the great counselor to lead us into the right path. It says in Psalm 37, 23, the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord and He delights in their way. Did you know that the Lord delights in the way that you take this morning? He delights in showing you where to go and what to do if you simply look to Him. Psalm 73, 24 says, You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Hallelujah. You will guide me every step I take in this life. And I always say this, Sister Jamie's pastor always said this, that if you follow Jesus long enough, eventually you will end up where He is. The longer you follow Him, the each step you take, those footprints in the sand, if you just follow Him long enough, eventually it will take you to glory he will lead us if we allow him to he will counsel us and guide us when we don't know what to do or where to go but we have to make the decision to trust him and to look to him proverbs 3 5 and 6 says trust in the lord with all of your heart and don't lean on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths He says, look, if you think you can do it on your own, you can try. But if you understand that your understanding is not enough, your wisdom is not enough, and you look to me, I will never let you down. I will never lead you down a path that isn't right. Acknowledge Him. It means going to Him in prayer. Asking Him, is this the right path? Or the decision I'm about to make, is this the right one? Jesus delights in being our counselor and leading us if we will simply listen to Him. Third, the Son is described as the mighty God. In Hebrews, this is two words. One is Elohim, which is God. And the second is Gabor, which means to be powerful, a warrior or a champion. Let me tell you this morning, Jesus is our powerful warrior that fights for us. He is our undefeated champion that crushed the head of the serpent on the cross. He is the champion of champions. He's the Lord of lords. He has all power and glory. He says, I have the keys of hell, death, and the grave. I trampled under every demonic power because As I overcame, you too can overcome. Can you say amen? Amen. When we look around us at our world, the battles we face and the foes of darkness that war against us, it's easy to become disheartened. 
We have much against us. We have the world, our own flesh, and the devil himself continually fighting against us. There's no doubt that if left on our own, we would be overwhelmed and quickly destroyed. But the fact of the matter is, we are not alone. Jesus said in John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus said you will have battles, but because I overcame, you also will overcome. Romans 8.37 says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. When you become overwhelmed by the attacks of the enemy... Remember, we serve the mighty God. And he promised in his word that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God would raise up a standard against him. He'll say, devil, this far and no further. You can't cross the bloodline. You can't get to my child when they're standing on the rock of ages. Hallelujah. He's already won the victory of Calvary. And the enemy is a defeated foe. But what is required of you and I this morning is that we stand, that we endure, that we have faith in the one who is our victory, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the mighty God on our side. And if God be for us, who can be against us? If God is for me, if I have the mighty God, not only with me, but in me, then what on earth can destroy me? What on earth can overcome me when I serve the mighty God? Amen. Fourth, he's described as the everlasting father. Now we know that this scripture is in reference to God the Son, not God the Father. So why does scripture call him the everlasting father? Well, let's look at it. In Hebrew, it's Ad or Abba which literally translated Father of Eternity. Now this does not mean, once again, that Jesus is God the Father, but rather He is the source and the creator of everything. He's the Father of time and eternity. He's the architect of the ages. And along with this, He's also the representation of the Father to this earth. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It says in Colossians that in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Every time you look at Jesus, you see the whole Godhead. You see God the Father. Jesus is the perfect picture of the Father to us. Because of Jesus, we know we have a loving Father who has always been and always shall be. He'll never leave you or forsake you. As a father, he watches over us. He protects us. When we need correcting, he corrects us. When we need encouraging, he encourages us. When we need provision, he provides for us. Romans 8, 14 through 17 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer it with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Jesus is that everlasting Father. He's the Father of eternity. He's the Father of all time. He's the Creator. It says by His mouth all the worlds were created. It was through Him. And when He came to this earth, He came as a mission, not just an ambassador of the Father, but an exact representation of who the Father was. He says, you want to know what the Father's like? Look to Me. You will see the Father's love. You'll see the Father's grace. You'll see the Father's mercy. Fifth and last, Jesus is described as the Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace in Hebrew is Sa Shalom. This is an immense word. It means far more than just peace. It means completeness. It means wholeness. It means a well-being. It means that not only do we have peace, but we have no lack, no emptiness, no holes. Nothing's missing when you're filled with God. Listen, we, we've said it before, that within every human being, there's a God-sized hole. And that you could try to fill it with whatever you want, but you'll never fill it. But listen, when Jesus comes into your heart, into your life, there's no empty space. There's no place where there's room for more. He, God will fill you and overflow you. Hallelujah. With more of Himself. 
We are complete and whole in Him and through Him. He gives us peace outwardly, even in the hardest circumstances. And He gives us peace inwardly, that we're right with Him and that this world is not our home. We're just passing through. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Philippians 4, 6-7 Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let me tell you something. There's a peace that passes understanding. There's a peace that God can put into your life that you have no reason why you should feel peace in that moment. But God can bring you through the darkest night, through the biggest storm, through the hottest fire. On the other side of it, you understand that through it, God kept you all the way. And He gave you the peace that passes understanding. It's hard for the world to understand how Christians can lose everything and still smile. How they can hurt, be hurt by other people and still love them. Why? Because the Prince of Peace lives in our hearts. When Jesus was asleep in the boat in the midst of the storm, He was there in the back just sleeping away. Why? Because He trusted in His Father and trust brings peace. You want a tester to see how much you truly trust God. How do you act in the midst of your storm? When things begin to unravel around you, are you at peace or are you wringing your hands? If you're wringing your hands, then your eyes aren't on Jesus, they're on your storm. Remember, it was as long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus that he walked on the water. But when his eyes got off the Prince of Peace, then the peace left. Your spirit will be at peace when you trust in God. As we close this morning, let me encourage you to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the son that was given, the son, the wonderful son that was given for you and I, the one who is truly wonderful, the one who is our counselor that we can trust to lead us, the one who is our mighty God that defends us, the one who is the master, the source and architect of all time as well as of eternity, the everlasting Father, who is the perfect image of the Father to us. He's the Father that never leaves us or forsakes us, who keeps us all along this journey. And He's the Prince of Peace that will keep you through every storm, every fire, every trial, Every attack of the enemy, he'll keep you through it and he'll bring you safely home. Unto us a son is given. Unto us a son is given. The greatest gift that has ever been given. I want us to thank God this morning for the most amazing gift. One that was not laid under a tree but one that was laid on a tree the one who willingly gave his life he willingly gave his life for us a son is given